you for joining us today on the OpenStack Thunderdome. Now, for those of you who don't understand why this is a Thunderdome, we have here a cast of very shady OpenStack characters who want you to believe that what they are doing is the best way to do it and to give them your money. So, the, the, as I just briefly mentioned, the rules are that they cannot hit each other below the belt. If you do say an F-bomb, the foundation might have something to say about it, but you all have board seats, so that's not down to me. I'm just here to moderate this panel. So, um, we have uh, Christopher McGowan, Chris Kemp, we have Jesse from Blue Box, and then we have Alex Friedland, and we have Randy Bias. So Jesse is basically, uh, Jesse's the only one that really doesn't, um, I guess, con contribute personally code to the foundation, but everyone else here is very... Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's no ATC. I had six reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Doing my part. Uh, what is code, actually? <laughs> wow. Jesse, did you outsource the Marantis for the six reviews? Yes. <laughs> all right. So, um, it's all the same oh line yeah. Marantis code. Yeah. So, so long as I don't have to write it, it's oh possible, okay. yes. Yeah. Let's yes. Mock up what this guy's doing. <laughs> all right. So, my first question to this Motley crew is how is your product distributed and why? And you have to say why one other person on the panel's distribution is shit, and why. So, for the can we all agree that it's Randy's? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Randy, but Randy is now EMC's. That's yeah, okay, he's right? it's now EMC's. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for that, for the first question, I think I'm going to pick on Kemp. Well, so we actually are unique, I think, because we sell OpenStack as a piece of hardware that you plug a rack of servers into that you buy, uh, and they can be Dell, IBM, Cisco, HP, Supermicro, uh, Fujitsu. Uh, so uh, we've done this because OpenStack is frankly very complicated, and uh, Nova has eight or 900 config options you can set when you run it. And uh, you know, if you uh, try to do this yourself, you'll end up having to uh, hire a bunch of people who really know what they're doing, and then they'll need training from Arantis and consultants from Arantis, and pretty soon uh, you're, you, ha you have a months of, of uh, work you've put into a very custom OpenStack, and then it doesn't work with anything else. And so what we found is uh, if you want to have uh, OpenStack be the center of the universe and you want to build your own service provider, um, there's some great people here that you want to talk to. If you just want to turn, turn something on and have it work and, and be as close to Amazon, where you pull out a credit card and you just start using it, um, we think we've got the best approach. Oh, so why is one of these, wait, wait, Jesse, you gotta wait. Why is, why is one of these, stop on that. yes, stop. So why is one of these other people's distribution wrong or shit, and, and why do you believe that? And then that person will then get the mic to be able to talk about what they really do and defend it and move on from there. Well, you know, I think that, Knobs are useful if you want to customize your deployment, and so I think uh, we've got some great software um, w which has which has some knobs. Um, you know, if you really want to go all in and you're you know eBay or PayPal or a telco, uh, you might want to have hundreds of, of consultants and engineers working on it. So we've got some people up here to do that, um, and then Jesse hosts it. And so if you don't want to own your own hardware and you don't want to do anything, this is a good model. I don't know what Randy does uh, other than <laughs> keynote conferences and go to Asia a lot. So I I would say. Randy. Well, apparently I have the world's <laughs> largest retailer with a 22 rack proof of concept on 2,000 cores that's going to grow to about 60,000 cores in the next several years. So as far as I can tell, what I do is I build the world's best production grade OpenStack uh, systems that have ever been produced. Okay. Fair enough. But Excuse me. How does it ship? C excuse um, me. Can you guys introduce yourselves? I no. have no idea wh who works for who, so, 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 so that would help. Christopher McGowan is founder and CTO at Piston, so they have their distribution. And then Chris Kemp is with Nebula, their distribution. I believe he likes to be called Chris C. Kemp now. Oh, don't forget. Hardware, not distribution. And unfortunately, the first slide that would have had all the detail was um, a little bit wonky. It worked on the slide, but when we actually played it, it looked like this. Oh, nice. Yeah, kind of messed up. So, 
hence why we didn't actually get to show it. Jesse is a co-founder and CTO of Blue Box, which actually does host it, um, OpenStack. And then we have Alex Friedland, co-founder of um, and CEO of Morantis, which is services, subscription, and also training of OpenStack. And then we have Randy of uh, Cloud Scaling that was acquired by EMC. And you just heard that his is the one that's the only production grade distribution of OpenStack. And so you were going to how awesome your stuff was and why someone else's was pants and who was Also, next. how it's delivered. Um, so the way it's delivered is that um, we do an over-the-wire installation of the initial uh, boot box, and then that box is the center of the control plane, and it bootstraps all the rest of the boxes uh, basically with Pixie. So it's uh, very similar to the way Nebula basically works, except instead of putting our appliance in, we bootstrap the first uh, box by hand, which then bootstraps the rest of the cloud. And why is yours better than, say, Pistons? <coughs> Well, some of this is relative, okay? So, you know, I think that Piston is a solution that's appropriate for certain kinds of uh, things, but I'm not gonna pick on them today. Um, I'll explain why in a second. Um, but, you know, why I think that ours is better is that um, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, not use uh, pieces of OpenStack and methodologies of OpenStack that were fundamentally broken. So, for example, we don't use Neutron because it's a flaming piece of crap and if you use Neutron, you're almost certainly not gonna have a scalable network. So we do something else. We have our own layer three networking model. It plugs into Nova networking and it scales very, very well. We've never had a problem with it. It's totally bulletproof. It's very high performance. You get maximum east-west uh, performance. And so as far as I know, we have one of the few OpenStack uh, distributions that actually has a very high performance network, right? It doesn't use the crazy Nova network, single host, multi-host you know, BS that was made by somebody who doesn't understand networking at all. Um, to, to, to interject briefly, to speak in Neutron's defense, it's not just that it's a flaming pile of shit. It's that every SDN on the planet is even worse. Th there is absolutely <laughs> truth to what McGowan just said. I agree with that. Um, but you, know, you don't, strictly speaking, have to uh, uh, use Neutron with an SDN. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the problem is, is that uh, if you try to do networking as a service, like, you know, there's, what it, I mean, like, there's like 20, 30 years of networking gear. You can stick that all under a single API and a monolithic architecture. I mean, think about it. That's a fool's errand. But anyway, getting back to it. Uh, and then the second thing that we did is that we were the first to build a scale out control plane. So what most everybody else did is they did HA failover. So you had active passive on all the OpenStack services and your services. And then they did master election systems, which Piston and Nebula do, where you've only got one instance of a service running time, but when it fails, you can reinstantiate it somewhere else. And we thought that didn't make any sense because then the control plane has to scale up. You have to make bigger boxes out of the control plane because if you run out of oomph on the APIs, that's your only option. So we built active, 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 active. So we've tested it up to seven for this retailer and we know we can get up to 30 theoretically. Um, and that's pretty awesome because it means that even if uh, Nova or one of the other APIs has crap performance, we get that crap performance times seven, nine, 11, whatever it is. Okay. So it's your turn, Christopher. Oh, I didn't get to say a, a bad thing. Touche. So <coughs> I have a bad habit of running people over, and I've tried to, you know, train myself out of that for the last seven years. So I'm not going to – I'm going to pick on the person I like the most on the panel because I know that they won't, like, punch me later. So, Alex. <laughs> <coughs> I just want to say that the main problem with the Miranda's distribution, other than the fact that they're a fantastic group of guys, um, is that um, the idea that there's zero lock-in is selling snake oil. Because there are pieces of OpenStack that are fundamentally worthless without plugging something in that creates lock-in. So if you get Cinder, you don't get block storage. Okay, yes, you can carve you know, block device out of you know, LVM on a KVM hypervisor. Nobody thinks that's block storage. Right, okay, that's why they're all using Ceph, right? So the thing is, is that there's always lock-in in OpenStack, and when you market it as there being no lock-in or the zero lock-in pure play solution, you're simply selling your customers bullshit, and because they want that thing to exist, and they're buying it, it sort of is a little bit um, misleading. Gosh, <laughs> I have to respond now, right? Yes, you do. So um, the beauty of the, my position here is that 
I didn't understand a single word that any one of those guys <laughs> said. <laughs> because I have no idea what networking actually means inside. And uh, the only thing I know is that OpenStack is good. And, um, um, and we figured out this early. So we called Randy and said, Randy, do you have a project for us? And that's how we started in this business. Ah, oh, you heard that. It's, a, it's official now, yes. Randy is the father of, well, in some ways, Mirantis, yes. <laughs> um, and um, um, so since we never understood what it really was, we just went to customers and said, we will figure it out with you together. And we did that with about 135 is the last I could tell. And uh, um, the distribution we built, we just took the information we learned from those customers and packaged it into a distribution. And then we distributed basically for free. And so last I checked, we had 10,000 downloads this year. And uh, um, it's probably not a good distribution because of all the reasons that Randy suggested. But we have uh, probably 20 customers in production with thousands of VMs. I think one was actually a keynote today. And um, some big telcos have announced that um, they're, you know, like Ericsson announced that they're going to use it and are using it to go to all of their telco customers. So I'm not sure how it happened because I'm not technical, but um, I guess these guys are right. So you can pick on Christopher then. Christopher. Why is mine bad? Um, I'm used to picking on uh, Josh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually have a thicker skin than he does. You do. Yeah. So, so let's explain. So Josh McKenzie was co-founder with Christopher at Piston, and he's now gone to be field CTO at Pivotal Labs, and that's why he's not here. So I've heard that um, you have a wonderful distribution because you have brilliant engineers, and you've completely reinvented OpenStack. It's much better now, but um, it exists only in a Piston box. Is that true? Not really. We have really in intelligent engineers. Um, so I'm the CTO of Piston. Our product is actually a software platform that deploys cloud applications that we just happen to use to deploy OpenStack because that was the first thing we did. We were the f among the founders of OpenStack. Joshua was there at, uh, with Chris Kemp at Nebula, the NASA Nebula project before even it was nascent at Rackspace that we were going to do a thing. I was at Slicehost, and when we kicked off the Austin Summit in Austin, surprisingly, um, OpenStack isn't really good with naming, if you haven't noticed. Um, we were there. And we deploy our application, or we, uh, sorry, the, we distribute our product via the internet. You, we download an image, you install it on a USB stick, um, you install that, it becomes a boot node very similar to Randy's, where we, that ends up being the node that discovers other nodes automatically and then deploys via Netboot, via Pixie, uh, hardened Linux distribution. Um, and the where we go different is not that we use master election to elect a single uh, point. Um, we use master election and our orchestration engine that is not in OpenStack uh, to deploy all of the services everywhere. So we have a converged model where storage and compute and networking are all on the same hosts. And in so doing, we master elect only critical services. So things like the database need to be critical to the cloud. There needs to be one of them or there needs to be a cluster of them that deals with replication and I have and a question. Yes. If an attacker breaches one of the VMs and gets access to the underlying storage or breaches through the APIs and get access to underlying storage, does that mean that they can read the data of all of the VMs and the OpenStack database and the messaging queues? Not currently. We're using C groups to avoid that. Uh, if they originally reached all the way into the, the, the actual host metal and they're actually able to see the Ceph data store, does that mean that they can see all of the data? If they can see all of the data, if they, if, if they get to the point where they can see all of the data, yes, they can see all of the data. Right, so you, the hyper-converged is effectively you've squashed the control plane and the data plane together so there's no separation. So if somebody wants to draw a line around it, put like a firewall between it, they can't do that, right? If I walk into your data center and walk out with your, your controller server, can I see the data? No, you would not be able to see any of the object storage data. You would not be able to see any of the block storage data. You would not be able to see any of the VMs because the control plane is in a physically separate rack. And uh, it's uh, isolated in the network. So we're doing software firewalling between the two networks. We prevent all customers. We have actually uh, VLAN segregation for the customer workloads. 
Um, but if the customer or a, a an attacker were to break out onto the bare metal, they would be able to access the things that they could access. So I'm enjoying this discussion. Um, there's this whole book uh, called the OpenStack Security Guide, which we wrote, and everything that it recommends you do, we've done, including everything these guys are talking about. In fact, when you have hardware, you can actually take advantage of the TPM support on the motherboards of the servers. Uh, we actually have a hardware chip that generates random numbers so that encryption actually works in a cloud the way it should. Um, and you can do all sorts of things with key management, uh, storing encryption keys on the hardware. If you, if you uh, take uh, an approach where you plug it in, you turn it on, and it works, uh, you can make all these decisions, and you don't have to have all these debates. And it's, frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's really important at this stage of the market where OpenStack is so complicated. <laughs> So we also have TPM support. We are actually shipping that in production. It's at, um, there was a small telecommunications company. I actually wasn't at the keynote, so I have no idea if he actually spoke, but uh, Marcus with Swisscom, I, I hear they're, they're actually running TPM in Mount Wilson. All right, boring, boring, boring. My turn. <laughs> uh, wait, wait, wait. Do I have to say that your product is bad? Because I actually have no idea what your fucking product is. Oh, perfect. Well, let oh! me educate you. <laughs> let me educate you on the right way to consume OpenStack. So. Blue Box delivers private cloud as a service. That means each customer gets a single tenant OpenStack installation that is deployed on Blue Box hardware in our data centers. It allows us to deploy the implementation uh, today in three business days. Uh, by the end of the year, we should be within an hour. Uh, we handle all of the operations of the data center, of the hardware footprint, of OpenStack itself, leaving our users to uh, benefit from working with OpenStack, not on OpenStack. So, my good friend, Chris C. Kemp here, suggested that if you want to uh, be like Amazon, you should use his product. Except the entire point of being like Amazon is that you're not buying a proprietary piece of hardware and locking yourself into something on premise. We're able to deliver private cloud that just works in a data center without hardware that you have to, to deal with. Uh, without a proprietary box. So Blue Box is like all of the downsides of public cloud with all the downsides of OpenStack. No, it's all the positives of public cloud with all the, with all the positives of OpenStack. And I don't know about you, Jesse, but I personally do have a, a credit card with a $100,000 credit limit, so I can just... Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. You should so be buying his boxes all day long. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. So this leads on very nicely to who is your target customer? I'm going to start there, too. So... Uh, <laughs> There are, you know, like 100 customers, the Fortune 100, that are perfect for, for Randy uh, and for Alex. Uh, there are, I don't, I don't know who buys these things, but for everybody else, I can tell for you. everybody else in the marketplace, you've got Blue Box Cloud. We're private cloud for SMEs and, and the middle market. It's for those, again, who want the benefits of private cloud, who want data sovereignty, who want control of the platform, who want control of cost, uh, but who do want those benefits of public cloud, OpEx, elasticity, time to market, uh, open APIs. Uh, and so we found that this was the best model to deliver a product that really was, uh, was targeted towards that middle market customer base. Uh, we're selling to enterprises that are trying to transform themselves in from being traditional IT into web and cloud developers. Um, and also to service providers who are focusing on that sort of market, internal app development. Um, and we're a private cloud vendor, not a public cloud vendor. So some of the concerns from a security perspective, because they're building apps internally, aren't yet a problem for our customers. And Chris Kemp. Uh, uh, we're really focused on Fortune 1000, but not the top 50. Uh, so we're focused on companies that um, are probably using a lot of Amazon Web Services. Um, so our customers are some of the largest, the largest biotech companies in the world, the largest movie studios, uh, the largest uh, entertainment and web properties. Uh, all, almost all the national labs use our systems. Um, uh, NASA JPL, uh, uh, and these are all production like paid customers. Um, and so they're, po they're folks that are not at this event. Uh, our customers don't come to these events because they don't care about OpenStack, the details, they don't care about the implementation. They just want to have a private cloud, and they want it to be reliable, secure, and they don't want to hire a single person to build it, manage it, or operate it. They just want it to be an appliance. So um, I'll piggyback of uh, the Piston story. So we sell to customers who actually transform themselves. The trying part will have to remove. So uh, as a result, um, there are kind of two tiers. The one are the, the upper tier of those who are actually doing it. So we have the you know top 10 of the top I don't know, 50 telcos. We have top 10 of the top you know 100 enterprises. We have top 10 of the top 
I don't know, 50 web to all companies and, you know, kind of goes across the board. Um, and then um, we also have a lot of customers who are do-it-yourselfer types. And uh, a lot of those are just, they're interested in OpenStack. They go, <coughs> excuse me, they download our distro and um, they just work with it and we give them free support. And uh, they call us and say, we actually love it and how much is it? And they'll go, so much and they're great, here's a PO. So we kind of, you know, to go interject, that actually isn't DIY, it's DI5KR. That's do it with 5,000 Russians. <laughs> nah, <laughs> it'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, the 5,000 Russians is the, um, the, the top 10 there. That's where <laughs> they, uh, they go. The DIY is actually you do it yourself to the point where there are no Russians are involved, except on the support with an accent. Um, <laughs> But that works very well because we measure it every time with the, um, uh, what is it, the customer satisfaction index and whatever, and it's actually quite high even with an accent. Um, but um, there we're measured by how many Russians were not involved in selling a PO, and we're doing quite well there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have an extra one for you, Randy. How, is things, uh, how are things going to be changing now that you're part of EMC <coughs> with your target customer? Uh, they're not changing with the target customer. The delivery model will change. The target customer hasn't changed. Um, you know, uh, how many people have heard of pets versus cattle? That sort of cloud meme. Okay, great. So uh, we like to sell to enterprises that understand that they want to get a cattle cloud, that they want that Amazon-style experience because they're adopting DevOps and they're working on next-generation cloud-native applications. And if they're really focused on trying to make their data center cheaper or get rid of VMware and have a lower cost VMware, that's not really a good fit for us. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to be the guys who deliver, you know, the water, you know, the plumbing inside your house or the electricity. We just want you to turn on a tap and for it to come out and as much as you need, you use. And then you don't really think about it. You think, you know, more about the applications that are running on top of it. That's really our focus. And, you know, EMC is really interesting. Um, you know, if you had told me like a year ago, hey, you're going to wind up being part of EMC, I would have been like, no fucking way. Um, but it's turned two months ago. Uh, two months yeah. ago, it was starting to change. And <laughs> but that w we were we were talking a lot to them a lot more then. And um, the thing is, is that what's been very clear is that they are really believe in the world is changing. If you look at uh, I've we've got a product deck that we show our customers and I've got source data from EMC in there. I've actually been using for about a year that shows that they, the net new applications, the more cloud native applications are growing at 10 X the rate of the legacy applications. And you know that I love that, you know, that's where I want to be, right? I don't want to fight on the hill with VMware cause they own that hill. I'm just going to get tore up going up and I want to fight on a new hill where I can be king. You know, Amazon's king in public, but nobody's really king in private. And so I generally think that's what OpenStack should be doing, but that's, that's where we focus. And that's where EMC wants us to focus because EMC still, you know, VMware's part of the Federation still has a place, you know, and is there. And, you know, we want to continue to make them successful, but we think they're good for one thing. And we think that OpenStack running on EMC gear is good for another thing. Okay. So that brings us to the next one. Then I'll start with you, Randy. Is OpenStack's velocity a help or a hindrance? Obviously, it's helped you with the company being acquired, but is it a help or a hindrance Which for your velocity? Customers? The hype velocity or the code velocity? Pick one. Uh, the hype velocity is very helpful and continues to be helpful. Um, I'm not sure that the code velocity is, it seems to be decreasing pretty dramatically, especially in the core projects. And um, we're seeing to be slowing down, the innovation rate slowing down. Um, I think that we are sort of jammed up because we are under the illusion that we're gonna fix certain very broken parts, like I named Neutron earlier. I'm gonna try not to name anymore so I don't get you know, nasty emails and phone calls from PTLs. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we There's need to 22 of them now, so you, you yeah, <laughs> if I can figure out who, who, who it is when they call me. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the velocity of the code is in some ways it's slowing down is actually starting to be a help. Mm -hmm. But that's only because I think people's eyes are opening. I don't know if people probably weren't here for the board meeting yesterday, but in case you missed it, the technical committee came to the board and they said, uh, we finally get that there should be competitive projects. Like there can be m more than one block storage solution, more than one object, more than one compute maybe even. And uh, we want your help to figure out how to make that a reality in the community. And that's been a, a pet peeve of mine for a while because what happens is somebody implements a very broken solution um, and nobody else can create an alternative to it because it's not the blessed you know, special version. 
And sometimes if you're a good startup or you're a good software development team, you build something and you realize you built it wrong and you just want to throw it all away, start again, take all the learning because the learning matters, not the goddamn code. I do not wa know what it is about developers who are so attached to the code. Like, you know, code is easily rewritten. What's most important is architecture and the learning that you have that actually makes the system work. Do you think that the foundation is going to be able to represent even more innovation or more contributions that are coming in? Yeah, I mean, I think if we if we have a monolithic um, system where there's only one project in each bucket, compute, object, block, and all of those have to be integrated together tightly every six months, then that mm -hmm. fundamentally falls over when you're 9, 10, 11, 25, 30 projects, right? I mean, it was good at two. It was, it's a terrible idea now. Um, if you if we act more like the Apache Software Foundation and we have a whole bunch of projects that are all interrelated that can be put together in various ways and there are groupings that we test and validate on some kind of you know cycle then you know it's going to make a lot a lot more sense and each of those teams can operate at different speeds right now we operate at one speed altogether and it's very uh, you know tough <laughs> Technically, we operate at uh, one speed, and then one of these things is not like the other speed. Uh, Swift refuses thus far to adhere to the every six months release cycle, and it's actually been very good for Swift. Um, but for OpenStack as a cohesive unit, it does a lot of its things its own way and refuses to join the community. Yeah, but that, cohe that cohesive unit is going away. The yes. That's what the TC just said. So yeah. <laughs> well, so let while me at the same time still enshrining Swift as the paragon of what everything should be doing. I, I don't think that's well, that's a bit. So let me add my two cents because uh, we took the baton from uh, uh, Chris and Nebula, who were a huge authors of OpenStack originally, but now of this esteemed panel. Uh, Mirantis has actually moved as um, um, a number three contributor. Uh, we had. Uh, 92 people contributing to OpenStack um, in um, the latest in June release. And if you look at StackForge, we're by far number one with like 150 people and all of the innovation. And some of the scandals that um, uh, we've talked about actually got started by, um, uh, who, who here knows what Rally is, Project Rally? Uh, quite a number of hands. So we started Rally because we figured that performance of OpenStack was not something that um, was up to the par. And also it was very, very difficult to convince people to fix problems in multiple projects at the same time. So we started Rally as a project to kind of drive that. And as a result, then you could have, you know, built a use case that shows performance across the board and you could diagnose it to seven patches in three, three different projects. And you can do them as um, bugs and fix them as bugs without necessarily having to coordinate that. So. That became extremely popular. Lots of people are using it. And um, when we tried to incubate it, uh, it got stuck with, it's not your agenda, it's mine, and I'm not going to let you. And that's what caused this whole incarnation, I mean, that consternation. And that's why uh, we're changing the governance. But going back to the um, original project uh, question, I think the, fa um, the speed of innovation inside OpenStack and this code velocity is actually unbelievably fast. Yeah, I happen to disagree with uh, Randy here. Uh, uh, maybe, but uh, it depends how you measure it. I mean, there is a lot, lot of feature innovation, and there is a huge movement of OpenStack now into into things that it hasn't been, you know, conceived to do. It goes away from just being IIS, and OpenStack is becoming a full stack slowly, and the movement is starting up the stack with you know projects around it, into you know, the operational areas and the like. So, not to disagree there, but OpenStack has always toyed with becoming a PaaS. Like at the very first summit, there was a guy, Eric Day, who was an employee of Rackspace who had built a queue as a service project and couldn't get people to get involved yet because it wasn't ready. So OpenStack has never been, oh, it's just the IIAS. Well, it has been the, we're we toy with the idea of becoming a platform as a service. It was originally conceived as being a platform as a service at NASA Nebula. Um, and the fact that Projects are proliferating in such a way that, wow, that's really hard to say. You want to jump in? All right. I, I want to just violently disagree with all of you, and especially Randy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Safe harbor. Safe I harbor. talked to Jesse. I must be doing something right. <laughs> How many of you guys get the emails from Amazon about all the new services that they're offering, all the new uh, Amaz AWS stuff, right? They're I get those. Yes, there are already a whole bunch of things, and OpenStack is not. 
And so it really frustrates me when we talk about how we need three or four different competitive object stores or compute engines or when we can't even come close to keeping up with the innovation of Amazon. Amazon has figured this out. They have one platform, one system that they deploy at extreme No, that's scale. not true. Actually, uh, Chris, Chris, they have Chris, a bunch of Chris platforms. Brown, Chris Brown, who you know, was on my advisory board for four years, was lead developer for EC2. Out of everybody here, I have the most insight into how Amazon works. And the way that Amazon works is that there are a bunch of independent teams that work on each of the different projects. Many times, these projects are competitive with each other. Anybody remember SimpleDB, which was replaced by DynamoDB, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you can store your objects in DynamoDB if you really want to, and it's based off of SSD. So actually, there's a high level of overlap, and there's a huge amount of innovation from Amazon and Google because all the different project teams actually all innovate in, in different, uh, they're not in lockstep, they all go at different rates and they're all doing their own things and they're very independent. It's a Randy, loosely coupled Randy, system. I and so in aggregate, they get more You're throughput. missing my point. Millions of Amazon customers all use the same DynamoDB. They use the same S3, they use the same EC2. There might be different compute clusters around the world. Every OpenStack customer builds their own highly bespoke OpenStack cloud with a whole bunch of different decisions about the yes, hardware they run that, it on. Though. And, and, and that's great for a consulting having, having business. Having competing projects doesn't necessarily uh, make that problem worse. Well, wait a minute, though. I, so, so this is from an outsider who's not on the board or anything else. Do you know what I see? I see a lot of boys, and I know that they're they're coders too. I'm not dis disagreeing. But I see a lot of arguing about my project is better and why. And most of the people who are contributing these codes and actually trying to make all these features have no ops experience at They've all. They've never run it. They're, they've never run it, and most of the people they who are sitting no in this room have no idea want to be able to run this stuff. Well, you guys treat it as a science project and as a frat house. People here actually have businesses to run on it. So, which of you actually solved that problem? <laughs> All <of us>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you buy our box, you plug it in, it works. <laughs> or you buy ours as a service and it works. I mean, look, Am Am Amazon has 138 services last time I counted. Uh, OpenStack has, what, 22? Um, and and projects. official projects, right. And what did we hear at the keynotes yesterday? We heard over and over and over, stability, stability, stability. So we, we've got this problem, we, we can't keep up, we presently can't keep up with Amazon's innovation, yet the core of the project is, is being uh, rotting to some extent from a stability perspective because of these, these integrated releases. Uh, it, it's an interesting challenge. The other piece here that, that's fascinating is you've got sort of this marketing machine uh, that is these releases. And so every six months, this new release drops. And that means that every six months, customers will come and they'll say, are, are we running the latest thing? Uh, because we read about it, when in reality, the latest thing may not have bits or pieces that you actually need in the environment. And so you, you've got this interesting duality between tracking that latest thing, and, and all of us need to take that latest code and integrate it and make sure it works with our with our whatever, whatever product we're delivering. Uh, but the benefit of whatever is in that release may, may not even be necessary. So. Uh, it, it's quite, quite the, the, the six month release schedule is quite the challenge and it'll be interesting to see uh, the way Swift does it, if we can move to that model and we have competing projects, I think that will allow people that operate OpenStack to pick the best project that actually works, uh, put the, f the, the flag and the weight of, of each of our engineering teams behind that type of, that, that particular project um, and theoretically get more like Amazon in the way that they develop internally and thus hopefully get closer to the number of services that Amazon has. I also think we've got a little bit of identity crisis. Like, PaaS in OpenStack is the worst idea I can possibly imagine. We've got Cloud Foundry for PaaS. Let's focus on making a stable platform that something like Cloud Foundry can operate on. Um, and, and PaaS is a particular one because you're talking about something that's designed to do uh, multi-cloud ab abstraction. Uh, and so we, I, this we had a boxing match on that before, right? We on did. the PaaS, yes. Well, and so, so and we're still surviving. The, the good thing is that actually this whole thing is leading very well into the next section because we talk about the flexibility and the complexity because there's so many different projects and they're all competing and everything else, right? So, so with you had mentioned earlier was you guys have dealt with a lot of the customers with the early godfather of um, OpenStack cloud scaling the over there yes. to help you with uh, looking at customers and their operational problems and things like that. And to Jesse's point, six month projects Let's look. Let's talk about um, Xerox. They spoke at uh, Santa Clara last year when we had the uh, enterprise uh, open uh, OpenStack for the enterprise um, for forum, and they would up on stage loads of loads and loads of loads of nodes. But they were very happy running on Folsom. 
Now, there's a lot of us in this room who would not want to run Fulsome in a production environment, but you had Xerox who did. So, how? Mm -hmm. Okay, they're running. They're running Nebula. So, so the but but the question is, there are some people that don't want to move off of those releases. So, how d and what happens when it get, goes end of life? How do you know when to choose and what has helped with driving your decision for your distribution? For us, well, first of all. Um, just, just to give people an idea, today an average install that you know just does you know a st standard customer takes under a day. I mean, in uh, um, in a normal environment, you have to like do documentation and then things and training and all that. But OpenStack got to the point. Speaking of, you know, it's four years old, and uh, where a normal customer on heterogeneous um, uh, environment can get it up in, in one day, and sometimes they could do it themselves. And the beauty of this is um, we don't want to be opinionated. And I think the challenge that um, some of the early players in OpenStack ecosystem is they thought that they knew better than customers what customers wanted. And ultimately, we don't, we don't have a good idea of what the usage patterns are for OpenStack today. Today, going back, we kind of figured this out, but we have no idea how OpenStack is going to be used and why going forward. Because ultimately, it's becoming a commoditized operating system for the new transition of a cloud, and it will become a totally ubiquitous um, solution that can become an embedded solution for appliances, it can become a driver for somebody's loads in a, um, um, in a different, um, um, as a service model, and there are only so many people who can do what Amazon is doing and Google is doing for themselves, so there needs to be an alternative that will drive all of that. So what we said is we're going to listen to customers, we're going to create a configurable option that even a not very sophisticated customer can use, and then we're going to embed it to people who are just going to pull it through for whatever applications. And then eventually we will make sure it can be upgraded, but if you don't want to upgrade it, you won't. That's life, right? And some people just not going to upgrade. But then the danger you have if people don't upgrade to the latest version is eventually the stuff is end of life and support of it is going to be a problem. So we have plenty of customers who kind of went that route and built franking clouds, and it's working fine. But the problem with the franking cloud is that the cost of supporting a franking cloud is just going to increase over time, right? And so if they want to have the financial equation of supporting their own franking clouds, well, more power to them. But that's not where the business model is going. It's like a good business model, though. Mm, not really. For the 5,000 Russians? You know, we certainly couldn't raise the money we have raised if that would have been the thing, because uh, that doesn't scale. Right, and um, the only reason you know um, uh, we're able to raise money and continue to do this is because there is scale in the business model that we're going after, and the market is becoming vast. And if you ask my opinion as to where this is going to go, I tell you, I have no idea because what we're learning every day by talking to customers is they have thought of ways of using OpenStack that I haven't envisioned uh, even a month ago. And by the way, they downloaded my stuff and they configured it somehow and they told me what they did. And you know, the marketing folks over there go, oh my God, we have to build the use case. We had no idea it was possible. See, that's what I think is interesting about this market. So there are tons of customers like that, yet there's a whole other set of customers that say, I just want the, the benefits of a cloud infrastructure with, with the security and, and compliance that comes with, with private cloud. And so uh, what I really like about this panel, quite frankly, is we've got such a diverse set of options of how you can consume OpenStack, which is unique. It's unique to this uh, this technology uh, offering, and so we we've got something that works for whomever is looking to purchase it, and and that's really important. One thing I'll say: I once said that OpenStack was like the Linux of of uh, the cloud, and no one runs Linux. People buy Macs, right? <laughs> Ninety-eight percent of the computers run Windows, for God's sake. Um, I mean, I, I think you know it's a powerful platform. A lot of people power a lot of things with Linux, and a lot of people will build really amazing things with OpenStack. Uh, but I think if you want a cloud computer, you know, if you if you want to really democratize this technology and have every company, every enterprise, it's got to get really simple. You know, it's got to be so it's got to be simple enough for uh, people here in Europe to sell it and install it and and use it. And you've got to go into work in the morning and log into your email. Uh, which is going to be a SaaS application, and then log into a cloud and uh, build things and design things and prototype things and render things and sequence genomes or whatever you do with it. And I, I kind of agree with uh, Chris Kemp here. I'm surprised to say. I was like, wow, we agree with each other. Um, I'm actually... Uh, oh, yeah. 
I, I kind of uh, disagree with Alex. I think that the OpenStack distributions, the OpenStack products, all of the open, we should be extremely, extremely opinionated. The fact that we're not opinionated has led to a proliferation of all of these projects, a proliferation of all of these uh, competing drivers in the projects, none of whom have any sort of uh, like mutual. Com uh, they're they're overly com complex. They don't all they don't share uh, similar capabilities. You get an SDN in Neutron that does one thing and another that does another, and they don't implement the basic like I want an IP address or I want a port on this network. Um, and very similarly, though not as bad for Cinder, um, I would actually go so far as to say we should throw Zen out of Nova. Um, which is kind of heretical since Rackspace runs Zen, but they're the people who are building it. They shouldn't. It shouldn't exist. Um, so, so well that you wanted to add something before I move to the next one? Yeah, I mean, actually, there was a whole stu bunch of stuff queued up there. I'm gonna try to just pick one <laughs> response. Um, do people remember IPsec and IPsec VPNs yes. in the late 90s? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you remember how everybody took the standard and implemented it, and then none of their shit worked together? <laughs> yeah. Right, and still sometimes doesn't. Um, that is an example of why having the same software and having the same standards doesn't actually necessarily get you anywhere. What's really important is to test behavior and to be able to know that you've got the same set of features, functions, and capabilities. That's why DEF Core and RefStack and Tepest Test are so important, okay? If you have that, then like whether Swift is implemented one way or another way doesn't fucking matter because you can test that both the implementations do the same basic thing, all right? And once you do that, then you can have guarantees that every OpenStack cloud is not a snowflake. Now this gets to a fundamental problem, which is when people want to DIY or when they're building their products, whether any of us up here are right or wrong, they make choices about the, in, uh, about the architecture, and those choices fundamentally impact the behavior. So I'll give you some examples. If you turn on a VM on Amazon Web Services, you automatically get a public IP address. If you turn on OpenStack, you do not. You have to turn on IP auto assignment. So if in your distribution or product or whatever you chose to turn on by default, you act like Amazon and you're more interoperable with them. If you don't, then you aren't. And that's fine. It's not about whether you are or not. Please don't open the Amazon can of worms on me. The point is, is that all of those choices we make, since OpenStack can really be configured to be anything, is what gets us in trouble. And we don't spend enough time talking about the architectural best practices, the right way to put things together, what should the baseline set of features be in block storage and object and compute and so on that actually matter. Do we need live migration or not? What's the use case for it? All of those things are missing. Instead, everybody kind of does it their own way. And then that's the thing that leads to there being no interoperability, to there being snowflakes, to you know these things just not making sense and not adding up. Okay. But at the same token, that sort of opinionated thing gets us panels like this, is why all of you are here. Like, each and every one of you is actually here to listen to us yell at each other. And so leads, this is going to be a yes or no answer, okay? So we can get take some questions before we are booted out the door. I will also get kicked out at this point. So is OpenStack boring? Um, this is going to be awkward because Joshua McKenty says yes. I say absolutely no, and it should be. And it's a problem that it isn't. I agree. Yeah, no. Un unfortunately, no. No, but it should be. Is it a soft problem, Randy? N no, not even close. One day it will get boring, and it's going to be a multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry. And uh, all of us here are actually building it up, so that's a lot of fun. I hope it's never boring, because I think that means we've stopped innovating. Is it a solved problem, Jesse? No. Uh, you can buy a Nebula today, <laughs> uh, but OpenStack <laughs> is a mess. <laughs> uh, you can buy Piston OpenStack today, but OpenStack as a whole is a mess. Uh, we're shipping Icehouse. We probably won't ship Juno for six months, because there has never been an OpenStack release that has worked out of the box. Any and when it can, it will be. Any questions from the floor for our very cheerful panel who might want to punch each other in a few minutes? Actually, drinks are on Randy at the Hyatt Bar, um, <laughs> and the rest of us will be at the, the, the Meridian. <laughs> I want to add one other quick thing uh, just before we get to the final. Uh, so I'm actually leading a new effort um, called the Application Ecosystem Working Group uh, with Tim Bell at, in the user committee. And one of the things we're trying to do, now that we, we have a lot of uh, EMC and Marantis and uh, Blue Box and Piston and Nebula Clouds out there, people are starting to build stuff on them. They're starting to build applications on them. We heard the keynotes. 
Um, they're getting deployed in enterprises where people are trying to take passes. Um, so uh, we're actually having a session on Thursday. If you're interested in building an application ecosystem on OpenStack, and you know, if you're interested in interoperability between all the different products uh, from the folks on the stage here, uh, please come join us. Uh, it's on Thursday afternoon. It's the application ecosystem work. It's a 90-minute working session uh, where we're going to have a lot of people there working on it. I, I'm going to get in a last, a last <laughs> one here then, too. Um, so I just want to point out that um, the whole statement about Linux, like, uh, it doesn't ring true, right? Because the vast majority of servers in production are running Linux, right? So whether it's on your desktop or not doesn't make sense. But if you were to include desktops, then, you know, I think you should probably include handsets and Android is Linux and it's, you know, shipping, I don't know, a couple hundred million units probably every quarter. So, you know, if you added up the net amount of Linux out there, it probably outweighs uh, Mac and Windows put together ultimately, especially if you also look at ARM embedded devices. Linux had a benevolent dictator, though. Open yeah, stack, the OpenStack Foundation doesn't have one. Don't start uh, yeah, that. that <laughs> <laughs> we, we you, yeah. you talked Linux, so I had to get in there. This feels more like the war between the Unices bef almost before POSIX was invented, not so much Linux. <laughs> well and I'm not old enough benevolent, to... We're all benevolent, but no dictators now. So thank you very much to our panel. We can, I'm sure we'll continue this on Twitter or some other form of medium. But Ooh. yes, please come up. Come on, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have a question. Okay, now that all the big boys like IBM are uh, busy buying up the little startups, where do you see it going? What's going to happen to all that innovation <laughs> that we just spent the last four years building? <laughs> well, my answer is watch us, right? Because <laughs> um, we um, just, you know, the shameless plug, but uh, the talk the talk of um, a few months ago was, will there be um, somebody who can stand up in this market but the big boys are jumping on? Will there be somebody who is a standalone who will be able to play, you know, and challenge the big boys? And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we announced a hundred million dollar um, financing, and the message there was that it's possible for a small guy to be a standalone, and there are people who believe that it's possible to stand against the the big the big guys. And remember, the reason OpenStack came about in the first place. I mean, this, um, it is a way for, for customers with heterogeneous environments to create an even playing field and lack of dependency uh, from the big players. And that being said, uh, a small player, uh, a pure play OpenStack player, is the one who can create that level playing field and allow to get some of the profit margin uh, from... Um, you know, from the from the infrastructure stack over the long term, and that's the level of innovation that it will enable all the innovation that's happening in the ecosystem. And I think that's that's what we need to start focusing on: is how we enable quick and easy innovation for all the players who are not incumbents, because ultimately that's what customers are looking for. That's will end up destroying the cost and will enable you know the uh, exponential scale. And I think cut, that's cut it off. Dude, I'm not know. done yet. No, look, liquidity it's drives liquidity drives investment. Beers. Liquidity drives investment, and so you're gonna you no longer will see new distributions, but you'll see new entrants into the marketplace. You look at companies like Stackstorm. You look at companies like Platform Nine. There are people in the space that are doing new different things. Uh, I, I think it's a wonderful sign for the industry. Let all I, up, all I know is that the the average enterprise is going to have a very hard time consuming. DIY OpenStack. I'm not talking about the lean forward guys who are doing it now. I'm talking about the average guys who have a hard time running their SAN. Whether it's Chris's model, you know, any of these folks model up there, I don't know. But your average enterprise has to consume products, not science projects, and that is 100% certain. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, to your question, though, it's a fair question. I mean, $100 million is impressive. We've raised a lot of money as well from some world-class investors, uh, but we're all very small companies, um, you know, in the, in the scheme of $100 billion market cap companies, except for Randy. <laughs> Except what yes, exactly except does a VP Randy. technologist do? It's a fair question. <laughs> I, we're very early on in this, and I think uh, there's still a lot of really big companies uh, that really have to figure this out, and that might involve partnering with companies that are here on stage um, or some really bold moves. We've, we've already seen a few in the last couple months. You sort of stole my thing, so I guess I'm going to change it. Alex is actually buying the drinks. I had completely forgotten that you had just announced your your round. So congratulations, and now you're on. How much of that hundred million is committed? How much of the hundred million is committed? How much of the hundred million is committed to buying us drinks? No, 
Uh, and also well, committed. All right, we gotta go, guys. All we right. gotta go. Thanks hug it out. Guys. Hug it out. Big hug. Big hug. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you.